If you're in my shoes and you're trying to build something that's capable of going on ultimate adventure, you just you don't just need strong axles and big tires and strong steering and good ground clearance and all that, but you need to be able to maintain highway speeds comfortably. You need to be able to go on really rough dirt roads, which in my opinion are the hardest part of the entire thing. Miles and miles and miles of bumpy dirt roads like to show the weaknesses of vehicles. But on top of all of that, you need to start with an extremely solid foundation. Lexus LX450 is not only superior to the other vehicles in this competition because of its engine technology, transmission technology, transfer case technology, but it's also superior in the fact that it came factory with stronger axles. The rear axle is a factory full float and the front axle is a factory high pinion and it even comes with CVs right out of the box. When I think of the best strategy of building a budget build, I think that it's much more practical for your average Joe to find something that already has the qualities that you want and then slightly modifying them. In this case, we've got a vehicle that came stock with great suspension. We're linked front and rear, we've got four corner coils, and if you're doing something like Ultimate Adventure, that ride comfort is so important, I cannot stress this enough. But on top of that, we have an outstanding engine transmission transfer case combo and the axles, although they are not perfect, they are very strong right out of the box. So there's some really big advantages of these axles and there are some shortcomings. Today we will be addressing both and by the end of the video, we're going to have a really good understanding of what our gear ratios are going to be in the transfer case and in the axles. Plus, we're going to calculate what our final drive ratio is going to be after all this work. One of the weak points of these axles is the connection from this part of the axle tube to this part of the Burfield joint. And so what I did is I just we built a super simple, super ugly truss but this well gusset rather but this gusset is going to be super strong for two reasons not only is it going to shore up this thin point here but it's also connected to this bracket which is notorious for cracking so what i'm going to do is i'm going to finish weld the inside of this bracket i'm going to actually take a stick welder i'm going to weld down in there because i know that's too dirty for a mig same thing right here and then i think i'm going to build a front truss it's going to go from this bracket up across the center to that bracket, and then we'll build some sort of a uh, some sort of a guard for our ring gear. I really don't love the way these factory axle brackets are attached to this factory axle. It's done kind of how someone would just do in their backyard who is new to fabrication. And that's not a knock on Toyota. A lot of times on assembly lines, they will figure out the cheapest way to manufacture things accurately, um, knowing that a lot of people who drive these aren't gonna beat the crap out of them off-road like we will. So for that reason, I'm gonna use a stick welder. I'm gonna get down in this area that I can't clean very well because I know there's going to be a little bit of oil residue, definitely some paint, definitely some rust. And with a stick welder, you can usually get a lot more forgiveness and a lot less porosity in your welds whenever you're welding super dirty stuff like this. On top of that, I'm going to add some weld onto the inside of these brackets and make sure you can't see through anywhere. Everything's going to be covered in weld. Then I'm going to move to uh, this little tube that I have that's going to connect to our fill hole on the front diff. 
I'm going to TIG weld the outside of that because it's just going to be too difficult to get the kind of weld that I want with a MIG welder. And this is just one more example of why it's nice to have a multi-process machine because on one axle, we're going to use three different processes and it's going to be as simple as flipping a switch and welding stuff in. Full float axle housings will bend from usually one of two ways. One is you just simply overload the vehicle. You go like way above what it's meant to carry or tow or whatever. And two would be you're going super fast and you're slamming into your bump stops over and over and over. Neither one of those conditions are conditions that this rear axle is gonna see. And for that reason, I'm gonna do the bare minimum and I'm just gonna protect this ring gear to make sure that if I have to back up into a rock or something, I'm not gonna bang a rock through this housing and into my ring gear. This front axle now has a truss and we've beefed up around the lower part of this ring gear, which is definitely gonna be taking hits. But more importantly, the truss is tied into these brackets. The brackets are finish welded all the way around. And then this outer gusset is supporting, giving us a little bit of extra strength on that uh, knuckle ball and giving us extra strength on these brackets. So the front axle is done. Rear axle, similar situation. There's only one bracket that I wanted to beef up. This one right here, believe it or not, that back part wasn't welded at all. And then there was gaps in the welds down here. So I gave that a little bit of extra something, something. This is like the same lower control arm bracket, but the way it's designed has way more inches of weld. So I didn't find it necessary to modify that at all. And then we have a nice big overkill, <laughs> ugly, but homemade diff cover that is gonna make sure that um, this rear axle is not gonna see any damage. Now, we're at a point where we can gear and there is a ton of opinions of which, which way you should go whenever you re-gear your axles. But what I highly recommend you do is you learn how all this works so that you can make that decision for yourself. The picture you're looking at is a spur gear. This is not what a ring and pinion looks like, but this is a great way to understand how gears work in this five second tutorial before we start calculating gear ratios. So if you look at the larger gear, it's probably four times bigger than the smaller gear. So for this example, we'll just say we have a four to one gear ratio. So that means that for every one full turn of our larger gear, we're gonna have four full turns of the smaller gear. Ring and pinions work the same way, transmission ratios, transfer case ratios. So now we're gonna open up our like ratio calculator. And now that you have at least a very basic understanding of how these ratios work, when you're looking at all these different numbers, you're hopefully gonna be able to grasp what all of this means. When you have like 800 RPM of the engine, that doesn't equate to 800 RPM of the tire unless you have gearing for that. So we, we've got all of these different places that are gonna change the gearing, transmission, transfer case, and axle ratios. And that is what's gonna dictate how many RPMs of the engine will transfer to how many RPMs of the tire. The first thing that I wanna do is calculate a baseline of how this truck came from Toyota. And this is what I would recommend any of you do, no matter if you're building a Ranger, an International Scout, a Jeep, or in this case, a Land Cruiser, you should definitely calculate what your stock gears are gonna get you. So our biggest, the biggest hurdle that we're gonna have is making it to where this vehicle can still maintain 70 miles an hour going down the highway. So if we calculate everything out, if we calculate our highest gear, which is overdrive, so drive is one to one, overdrive in this case is 0.765 to one, and we're looking at the stock axle ratio, stock tire size, at 70 miles per hour, we're looking at 2,364 RPM. If we just threw a set of 39s on here and we calculated everything out the exact same, we didn't re-gear anything, 
we're now looking at that RPM dropping to 1,891. And you're looking at this engine spec, the peak torque comes in at 3,200 RPM. So not only is it harder leverage wise to turn this larger tire, but we're reducing RPM further outside of like that or further away from where our peak torque is being made by this engine. So we're getting hit double whammy. And on top of that, if we wanted to try to go up a steep hill in the summertime and we're trying to make it hold overdrive and we're only spending 1800 RPM, we're actually pumping less water through the, for, through the water pump, which will make it run hotter. Plus it's higher demand. You can see where I'm going with this. If we throw in our new gear ratios, these are all the ratios that I chose for this build. Don't just mimic what I do. Calculate what's going to work best for you. Our new gear ratio in the axles is 5.29 to 1. Our new high range in the transfer case is going to be 1.1 to 1. We're reducing it by 10%, and that's because I want to make sure that we can maintain freeway speeds. And then our new, la new low range is 3.115 to 1. So we're gearing down like every aspect outside of the transmission. So our new high speed, which is just 70 mile per hour cruising speed, RPM is 26 84 and you'll notice that that is higher than what the factory rpm was so i could very easily just i think maybe 488s or something like that would mimic what the factory rpm would be but i'm going to ask more out of this truck than what you would in the factory form so if you're towing you might consider gearing down a little bit lower than stock or in our case we're turning 39 inch tall tires all the time and so i wanted to make sure that we're hitting a higher RPM for a couple of reasons. Not only is 2,684, almost 2,700, closer to that 3,200 peak torque number that's coming out of the engine, but it's also because we're geared lower, we have more leverage to turn the tires easier. This is gonna make it to where we're flowing more water at cruising speed. This is gonna make this engine and uh, this just truck overall perform so much better. And on top of that, the main reason we're building this is for off-road and whenever you're if you gear everything way too tall off-road, you're gonna get higher transmission temperatures, you're gonna have less control on the rocks, and because we're gearing everything down so much lower than stock, we're gonna to get to have our cake and eat it too. We're gonna to get to use this thing on the freeway, we're gonna to get to use this thing on the rocks, and it's gonna perform really good in all of these different conditions. And I wanna say this one more time, do not just copy what other people are doing online, calculate this stuff out for yourself based on your tire size, based on whether or not you're towing, based on what your demands are, and you're gonna be a lot happier than if you just copy what people are doing and what someone on the internet tells you to do. The first step to installing a fresh ring and pinion is gonna be installing a shim either behind the race or we can reuse the factory shim that is gonna be behind the bearing on the pinion itself. So using a pinion bearing puller, I'm gonna pull this bearing off, we're gonna pull the factory shim out and we're gonna place it onto our brand new pinion. For whatever reason, it took a lot of extra force to get this bearing pressed on to the pinion, but in any case, it's on there. So now the next step is gonna be driving our new races into the third member. And you could do this with a traditional race driver, which I've, I have and I've done many other times, but I've recently found that it's much easier to just do this with a press, and so that's what I've been doing lately. Instead of driving everything with a hammer, I'm trying to drive as many things as I can using the press, because it's just a little bit less labor intensive. Then we need to get it in the ballpark of our pinion preload. This doesn't have to be super precise yet. We just need to get things to where they're dragging a little bit so that we can take it to the next step. It's definitely not, this is not in spec, there's no way. But we have the tiniest amount of drag on our pinion, which is what we want for this next step. Right now, we're just trying to get the pinion dialed and in order to get the pinion dialed, we have to check our pinion depth. Once we get our pinion depth dialed, then we can dial our dr the drag, so our pinion preload. And that's what I'm feeling right now is preload. So this has the tiniest amount of preload. There's no way this is enough, but this is enough to take all the slop out of the bearings and get it to where now we can dress our ring gear, we can mount our ring gear onto the carrier, which is our Airbnb locker. We can mount that in place, we can get everything as close to spec as possible. Then we can paint our ring gear. We can run a pattern and we can read that pattern to tell if the pinion is too deep or too shallow. 
I'm going to use a hard spacer instead of a crush sleeve. And instead of giving you a whole brand new breakdown of how all that works, I'm just going to steal a clip from a ring and pinion install video that I did a few years ago. The first thing we need to do is install our pinion. And before we can just go dropping the brand new pinion into this housing, we need to take the old pinion and pull some measurements off of it. There is a pinion shim that goes in behind this bearing right here. And what that does is it's gonna set the pinion depth. The pinion depth is basically what this entire job is all about. It's all about having the right amount of depth so that we have the right amount of tooth to tooth contact in the right spot <laughs> in order to satisfy the manufacturer's specifications. If you want this to go in deeper, you need to put more shim in it. If you need it to go uh, out and be more shallow, you put less shim in it. So there's a factory shim that is in this pinion that we're gonna harvest and we're gonna install onto the new pinion. We're gonna use a bearing puller. The best way to do this is to probably buy a pinion depth measuring tool. And that just goes into the, uh, it just goes right here in the housing. And then it, it, it gives you a perfect measurement between the center line um, to the face of your pinion. And that's really nice because with some basic math, if you have that measurement, you can figure out exactly what shim to put in there and you're usually money, but we don't have access to that. What most people do is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the factory shim out, we're gonna put it onto our new pinion, and then we're gonna use that to get us in the ballpark, and then by reading our pattern, we'll be able to tell if it needs more shim, less shim, whatever. The second thing we need to figure out um, off of this OEM pinion is going to be how big to make our crush sleeve eliminator. So there's a crush sleeve that goes right here, and what this crush sleeve does is it sets our pinion preload. These two bearings are opposing, meaning that they each face, they each go into a race and the two races are going different directions. So the tighter we make the bearings into these races, the more preload we're gonna have. There's a factory specification that we need to shoot for. And instead of using a crush sleeve, which is kind of a pain, we're gonna use a crush sleeve eliminator. And all we're gonna do is we're using a set of shims that are going to bring these bearings closer together or farther apart based on what we need. Now I'm gonna use a flat file on the back surface of the ring gear to just expose any tiny imperfections. And we could very easily take care of like a burr or a ding that might've been caused during manufacturing or shipping, or even if there's just something weird stuck to this, we can take care of that right now and make sure that we don't have any wobble in the ring gear later on in the install process. When you install the ring gear bolts, you wanna make sure that you clean all the holes out to just, there's no dust or dirt or anything in there. And then I prefer to use a little bit of red Loctite. There's technically, you don't have to do this step, but I have had a buddy who paid to have his ring and pinions installed on his Jeep. And in a couple of years, he had the ring gear walk off. So for that reason, me and a bunch of other people that I know, we use red Loctite on our ring gear bolts. And in this instance, I torque them down to 70 foot pounds. Now I'm gonna use our side adjusters to set the backlash. And the backlash is just the measurement of space between the ring gear and the pinion gear. And there's a spec that you need to go off of. In this case, I think it's six to 10 thousandths of an inch. And so I'm using a dial indicator to measure that backlash. So if things are a little bit too tight, which means that the ring gear is too close to the pinion, then we're gonna use these side adjusters to slowly slide that ring gear away from the pinion gear until we can get it in spec. And if it's a little bit too loose, same thing, but in reverse. This next part is what I think intimidates most people and discourages most people 
to not do their own ring and pinions. But I promise you, this is not witchcraft. We're not, we're not reading the tea leaves here. <laughs> you don't need a witch doctor. We are just reading the pattern that is being rubbed between these two gears. And by looking at that rub mark, we can decide whether or not it's acceptable by just comparing it to our Yukon book. It's really simple, honestly. So we've got these different, we've got four different areas that we don't want the rub mark to bleed into too much. We've got the heel of the gear, the toe of the gear. So inside is the heel, toe is the outside. Then we have our other inside, which would be the root. And that's the spot that I'm scratching right here. And then we have the uh, toplant, which is kind of a weird name, but that's what they call it. And the reason they don't just say inside and outside is because there's basically two insides and outsides. So if you were to try to communicate this to somebody else, there's a lot of room for confusion. So that's what the reason that all this stuff has special names. But the whole point is that on both sides of our tooth, we want to make sure that on this side, our drive side, the rub marks don't bleed off too far in any direction. We want that like fuzzy spot that we're looking at to be as centered in between all these places as possible. And again, if you're second guessing yourself, you can check the acceptable patterns list in the Yukon book and this will help give you the confidence. And a lot of people will just like take a picture or post it on the internet and be like, would you guys run this? You know, they'll, they'll pull on people who are experts. This is money. And this is such a great example as to why most, most of my Toyota friends who do their own ring and pinions choose Yukon because nine times out of 10, if you just throw the factory shim in there and then you put every, get everything to this point, and you start to read the tea leaves, you realize that we are like so dead on. I have a lot of confidence in this pattern, which makes me happy because it means we're not gonna have to pull that pinion apart nine or 10 more times. We're just gonna do it a couple more times to dial in our, uh, our pinion preload. And then once that pinion preload's dialed in, we can throw the seal in there. We can like finish the pinion side of things. Then we can, uh, oh, we do still have to drill our hole for our uh, Airby locker connection, but that's not a big deal. Then we can reassemble everything. We can do a final check on everything to make sure that it meets the specifications and guidelines in this book. And if it does, we're good to go. Once I remove the carrier out of the way, we can set our pinion preload for the final time. And there's two different tools that you could use to do this with. I've always used the bar style torque wrench. It works, but it's not like super precise. And every time I do a ring and pinion install, I just buy one more specialty tool just to slowly build out my arsenal. So now I finally have a really nice, much higher quality way of measuring pinion preload. But if you're doing this on a budget, spend the 15, 20 bucks or whatever, just get yourself a normal bar style torque wrench and you can measure your pinion preload this way. Now, again, we're gonna use the hard spacer instead of the crush sleeve because a lot of people in the rock crawling world believe that the hard spacer gives you a lot more durability because, and I understand why, this crush sleeve is not huge. It's not a big ring and pinion to begin with. And I could see that under really hard use, it would be very easy to crush that sleeve a little bit more get a little bit of deflection in that ring and pinion, and then boom, that ring and pinion's toast.
this method of painting the carrier is not like a usual thing. I was reading through the instructions and it did mention that the pinion might contact the carrier and then you would need to like grind a little bit around the end of the pinion and it looked super close. So what I decided to do is just paint the carrier, roll it through forward and backward, make sure there's no contact, wipe it clean. And now I know that I can move forward with the confidence of knowing this isn't gonna become, turn into a problem later on down the road. The rear goes together the exact same as the front. The only exception in my case is that I couldn't get the ring gear to fit without doing some grinding, which is not uncommon when you're doing really drastic gear changes like this. Sometimes you're gonna have to clearance some things here and there. So I just pulled everything apart. I got enough clearance. I put it all back together and then installed it just like you would any other ring and pin. The final checks when you're doing a ring and pinion are the most important out of all of it. So the last time that I put together, like once I put in my seal and all that other stuff for the pinion, I made sure that we were like perfectly in spec after everything is torqued, you know, everything was cleaned out before that final like install. Then once I put the carrier back in, I made sure that our backlash is absolutely perfect where I wanna leave it torqued everything down, double checked the backlash one last time, then ran one final pattern just to make sure I'm not picking up any weird issues. Then once all that checks out, I just spin it. I, uh, I like to pour some really thick gear oil, um, or in, my, in this case, I'm using Lucas, because I like that Lucas has, I mean, just a ton of hang time, it, especially with a high pinion. You don't want to let it starve um, whenever, you know, those first couple miles down the road, you wanna make sure that you've got plenty of oil in those bearings. Otherwise, if you starve them, you'll kill them. But everything feels good. I don't feel any weird binding. There isn't like a small, you know, something drop into one of the bearings. Like I would feel that right now. So it's really important to do these final tests. And the real final test that I'm doing right now on the bench is, this is, let's see if it'll focus on our gauge. This, it's, I accidentally put way too much air in there. But I'm doing an air test on the locker itself. I highly, highly, highly recommend. In fact, I'm not recommending. I'm telling you, if you have never done a gear locker or an air locker install, bench test it. It is so worth it because it's very easy. I've done this twice now. One on an Air B, one on a Yukon Zip Locker, where when I was installing the seal housing, it just barely took a nick out of the O-ring. And because I bench tested, I was able to figure out like, oh my God, there's a leak there. So right now, if there's a leak internally, that means that we need to send it back to ARB to be repaired. It's not something I ever ran into, but it's nice to be able to test it this way. And if there's a leak on the seal housing, then we can call ARB, we can get the O-ring on the way so that I'm not installing this in the vehicle, finding out there's an air leak and then having to uninstall it. Air lockers can be really reliable if you do your due diligence and you install everything correctly and then bench test it. So right now what's under pressure is the locker, the line to the locker, our seal housing, and those fittings that are going into the front of it. And it's been holding for quite a few minutes now. And I just heard it like go back. So I, I doubt you're gonna be able to hear this. Maybe, maybe you can hear it. Just kind of like a And uh, we can even put, we can put our shaft in there and make sure that everything's locked up. So. There's one side. These are actually the rear shafts, but it's the same spline count. And they are both turning the same direction. So that's good news. Now they should be, and we're going opposite directions. 
So we're in good shape. This thing checks out. I'm gonna check the rear. Then we can reassemble these axles and paint them. I truly believe that these Toyota axles punch way above their weight class. However, we're gonna ask a lot out of these because we're gonna be rock crawling on 39s and I mean, the truck is already super heavy from the factory. And for that reason, we need to make sure that every single part and piece that goes into these axles is not only the highest quality that we can find, but also very meticulously installed and everything, not just put together with an impact, but everything has to be torqued down to spec in order to ensure that we are maximizing the strength potential to hopefully give us the best possible outcome whenever we go and hit the trails at the end of the month. Everything on the inside of the knuckle needs molly grease because that's the best type of grease you can use for CVs just because of its ability to be super slippery. But everything on the outside, I'm gonna use marine grease because after years and years and years of wheeling in the Pacific Northwest climate, I have not found any other grease that holds up to abuse long-term better than marine grease. Our elements are very, very hard on things like ball joint grease. And what's nice about marine grease is it's just, it has additives to help shed water. And I've noticed that that helps keep the water out of the inside of all these bearings and stuff a lot longer than just normal high temp bearing grease. For axle shafts on this build, I'm gonna use RCV's front and rear. Not only are they the highest quality shaft that you can buy basically, I mean, they have the highest quality, highest strength materials, but I was taking some measurements and these shafts are actually slightly thicker than the factory shaft and the end is fluted. The stub shaft is fluted, meaning that there's a, a hole, a grease hole that goes all the way through the center and they gives, this gives us the ability to pump grease directly into the CV joint instead of just trying to like pump it through an access port on the burr field, hoping that it'll work its way into the joint for us. In my opinion, this is an absolute game changer, ensuring that we can take the best care of the CV joint and making sure that we can get the best longevity and durability out of it long-term. cost of some of these smaller upgrade parts makes the overall build cost grow so fast, but I find it really necessary to upgrade certain fasteners. And when I was looking at the design of these hubs, I immediately was trying to find some sort of a high strength replacement stud. And I found the ARP makes a high strength re replacement stud. So I've got ARP studs that we're gonna add on all four corners of this rig because that's gonna allow us to have a little bit more peace of mind whenever we're beating on this Lexus on the trail.
try to pack as much marine grease into hubs as humanly possible. I want it basically like squirting out as I'm tightening things down. And you can definitely over grease things, but you're only over greasing them if you are squirting grease into an area where it could fling onto your brakes. Otherwise, to me, there is no such thing. You want to have as much in there because it's more for water or elements to have to penetrate in order to get to your bearings. So for me, I pack lots of grease into every nook and cranny, and then I wipe it all clean, of course. But the whole point is to ensure that if I'm going through a bunch of water crossings, I'm on a super long trip, that water is not going to work its way into the bearings um, without having to penetrate through a ton of grease. So for that reason, I pack these as tight as I can get them with grease. To turn these big 39 inch tall tires, I'm gonna be installing hydro assist. And in a perfect world, I wanted to mock up and weld in the brackets for the hydro assist on the axle before I painted it. But once I got once I got things to a point where I could actually measure how much throw I was gonna need out of the ram, the ram I have is only a six inch throw ram, and this is gonna need a 10 inch. It's almost 10 inch on the nose. So I ordered a cheap 10 inch RAM online and we're just gonna have to do that in the next episode. Oh, you did help. I saw it move, keep going. This is a full float axle shaft and a full float axle shaft punches way above its weight class because the weight of the tire is actually mounted to a hub. This is a hub right here. I think you'd see it, yeah. This is a hub right here. So the tire mounts to the hub, the full float axle shaft goes through the hub and then it bolts into it. This is how one -ton axle, most one ton axles are as well. So you end up getting way more strength out of the same size shaft because it's not having, here, I've got a semi float right here. This is a semi-float axle shaft. Now this thing's beefy, super strong, and in the right application, I mean, these will last a very, very long time. But because the tire bolts right to the shaft, not only is it this shaft gonna see twisting forces, but it's also gonna see forces of the tire going side to side, like taking a really hard hit, especially if you're going fast and you're trying to goose it up a really nasty rock obstacle. So the semi-float shaft inherently is not as strong as the design of a full float shaft. So this full float shaft is really small, but it punches way above its weight class. This is a 30 spline, so this is equivalent to like a Dana 44, but it's stronger than a traditional Dana 44 rear because of the fact that it's full float. There is another weak point though. The other weak point is these studs, the hub studs. We've got the same ones that we used in the front hubs and these are ARP. They're extremely, extremely high tensile strength steel to replace the factory ones. We can actually cinch them down with a little bit more force. I need to find like a concrete torque spec for these. But anyway, for now, we're just gonna torque them to the factory spec. And then when I get like a concrete answer of what, how high I can go in the ARPs, we will. On top of that, we've got these shafts from our CV. So this replaces the factory shaft. It is not only made out of a higher tensile strength, tensile strength steel than the factory shaft, but it's really brilliant. These flanges that come with it, not only are we gonna bolt the ARP studs through them, but it has extra holes that um, you use as a guide to drill extra holes in the hub so you can put these hardened pins in there. So remember, this shaft is only gonna see twisting force and so it are these studs. So if we drill a few of these extra holes using this flange as a guide, it's gonna make it to where if we, if we were gonna break these studs, we are also going to have to overcome the extra twisting force that we're, that we're gaining from adding these little pins as well.
it's official, I'm throwing in the towel. This has been a rough two weeks. That's what you've seen in this video. It's about two weeks worth of work. Once I got it back from Dave, he had it for a month. I got it back from him. I've been pushing hard for the last two weeks. I am not gonna make it to Overland Expo in the morning. Um, I am so hot and sweaty. If it was one more hour of work, I would push it, but it, it's not. It's way more than that to finish building steering and all this. So this is gonna stay here for Overland Expo. I'm gonna take my Tacoma as soon as I get back. Um, I'm actually probably gonna come back early. We're gonna hammer out the rest of this thing. We're gonna get it in the woods. We're gonna have some fun with friends. We're gonna enjoy some summertime, not in here, but outside. And uh, then if it, everything passes that test, then we're gonna take it to meet up with the other teams and see how the Land Cruiser does in comparison to the other teams. The other teams are building some awesome rigs with axles that are way bigger and way stronger than these. So we'll see what they have in store for us. If you wanna save money on Yukon, on RCV, on all these Marlin crawler parts, on Warn, make sure that you look into the Elite Partner Program with Onyx Off-Road. You can save money through that membership by using, uh, but you can save 20% by using discount code Dirt Lifestyle, I almost forgot my own discount code. I am beat. I need to go get some water and some sleep. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.